my heart like you do. I could search for all eternity long and find there is none like you. There is none like you. touch my heart like you do. I could search for all eternity long and find there is none like you. Good morning. Welcome to worship. Today is the seventh Sunday after Pentecost, and we're coming to you from Grace Lutheran in Visalia, California. Well, we made it live and in person for four Sundays in a row, but now for a time we are back to online only mode. Thank you for receiving us into your home today. In this time of shutdowns across our state and nation and world, Today we celebrate our Lord, our Lord and the fact that no one can shut him down. Blessings this day on your worship. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of the word, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Today's Old Testament reading comes to us from Isaiah chapter 44, beginning at verse 6. This is what the Lord says, Israel's King and Redeemer, the Lord Almighty. I am the first and I am the last. Apart from me there is no God. Who then is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and lay out before me what has happened since I established my ancient people and what is yet to come. Yes, let him foretell what will come. Do not tremble, do not be afraid. Did I not proclaim this and foretell it long ago? You are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me? No, there is no other rock. I know not one. The epistle is from Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 18. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. In the Holy Gospel, according to St. Matthew, the 13th chapter, Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus told them another parable, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may root up the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time I will tell the harvesters, First collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, The one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the fiery furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. This is the gospel of the Lord. 
Praise be to you, O Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Isaiah chapter 44, verse 8. This is what the Lord says. Do not tremble, do not be afraid. Did I not proclaim this and foretell it long ago? You are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me? No, there is no other rock. I know not one. Our title, our theme today from that verse, No One Can Shut Him Down. No one can shut him down. This comes to us as a great comfort today, does it not? Especially when we consider that our doors had been closed, shut down to in-person worship for those, what did we count, 99 days? And when we consider that we had four whole Sundays with doors back open for in-person worship and for the Lord's Supper. And when we consider that church doors are closed off again for over 80% of the population across our state. It truly is of great comfort to us, is it not? That no one can shut him down. With shutdowns come much emotion, right? Maybe frustration, maybe fear, anger, sadness, confusion. Maybe we're overwhelmed or numb or maybe hopeless. In the middle of any or all of this, today we celebrate our Lord and the sure and certain fact that no one can shut him down. While I was digging into the background of today's words from the prophet Isaiah, I found a very intriguing paragraph penned almost exactly 50 years ago. And yet, it seemed to me as if it were written exactly for today. Maybe some of the language that caught my attention will catch yours too. Here's what those words said about Isaiah. God's messenger was equipped with unerring insight into human nature. What he discovered is not a pretty picture. The deadly malignancy of sin shows up in every son and daughter of Adam. The prognosis is death. 
However, there is a remedy for this universal malady, and God licensed his spokesman to prescribe it. No human physician concocted it. It is the miracle drug of divine forgiveness. The cure is complete. Sins, red like crimson, become white as snow. Because the Lord laid the iniquity of us all on a servant whose atoning blood was untainted by the virus of disobedience. No one can shut him down. First and foremost, no one can shut down our forgiveness in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's not that it hasn't been tried, right? You remember King Herod early on. When Herod realized that he'd been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under. He had every intention of taking Jesus out, of mowing him down. But I know you remember the warning, right? An angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. And I know you remember the other dream, too, later on, right? After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up! Take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel. For those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. No one can shut him down. But still, they tried. Remember the angry mob? In this case, it happened to be an angry mob of church people. All the people in the synagogue, it says in Luke 4, were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, and took him up to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him down the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. No one can shut him down. But still they tried. Remember their cry? Crucify him. Crucify him. We have a law, they said, and according to that law he must die because he claimed to be the Son of God. And I know that you remember Pilate's frustration at a silent Jesus and Pilate's threat he said, do you refuse to speak to me? Don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? And Jesus answered, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. In other words, no one can shut him down. He had a job to do, not to have his life taken from him, but to lay his life down because that's what he wanted to do for us. He had authority to lay it down and then authority to take it back again. No one, no one can shut him down. And because no one can shut him down, neither can anyone shut down our forgiveness. Have you thought about your baptism lately? There, the Lord called you by name, and there, the Lord claimed you as his own dear child. One of my favorite sections in our book of Concord is from the large catechism on baptism, and maybe you've heard some of these words before. I quote, In baptism, therefore, every Christian has enough to study and practice all his life. He always has enough to do and to believe firmly what baptism promises and brings. Victory over death and the devil, forgiveness of sin, God's grace, the entire Christ, and the Holy Spirit with all his gifts. In short, the blessings of baptism are so boundless that if timid nature considers them, 
it may well doubt that they could all be true. Suppose there were a physician who had such skill that people would not die, or even though they died, would afterward live forever. Just think how the world would snow and rain money upon him. Because of the pressing crowd of rich men, no one else could get near him. Now, here in baptism, there is brought free to every man's door just such a priceless medicine, which swallows up death and saves the lives of all men. It continues to appreciate and use baptism aright. We must draw strength and comfort from it when our sins or conscience oppress us, and we must retort, Nevertheless, I am baptized. And if I am baptized, I have the promise that I shall be saved and have eternal life, both in soul and in body. In other words, no one can shut down our forgiveness because no one can shut down our Jesus and I know that you know him. Have you heard the name Dr. S. M. Lockridge? He was born in 1913 in the state of Texas, and he was pastor at Calvary Baptist in San Diego from 1953 to 1993. He speaks of our Jesus and the fact that no one can shut down him down. The Bible says my king is the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I, I wonder do you know him? <laughs> my king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be at all sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he purifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's a key to knowledge. He's a well-framed of wisdom. He's a doorway of deliverance. He's a pathway of peace. He's a roadway of righteousness. He's a highway of holiness. He's a gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. And his yoke is easy. And his burden is light. I wish I could describe him for you. He's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. Well, you can't get him out of your mind. You can't, you can't get him off of your head. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. Well, the Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Tyler couldn't find any fault in him. 
I know you know him. That's our king. That's our king, the same king, the same redeemer, the same Lord Almighty that the prophet Isaiah quotes today when he says, I am the first and the last. Apart from me, there is no God. And he says to the horde of idols before him, as if they're standing before him in court, Look at the concrete actions that I have taken in history for the sake of my people. And now you, dear idols, you go ahead and tell me, what have you ever done? Go ahead and tell me what comes next in history. But with idols, it is exactly as the psalmist says. Their idols are silver and gold made by the hands of men. They have mouths, but cannot speak, eyes, but they cannot see. They have ears, but cannot hear, noses, but cannot smell. They have hands that cannot feel, feet, but cannot walk, nor can they utter a sound with their throats. Though on trial before the Lord and asked to speak, the idols cannot answer. And even if they could, what would they say? Nothing. They have nothing to say because they've done nothing. Not so our God. He says, do not tremble. Do not be afraid. My people Go ahead and serve as my witnesses tell me. Is there any God besides me? And today with Isaiah we boldly say, No, no, there is no other rock. I know not one. Or to put it another way, Our God our King, our Redeemer, our Lord Almighty is unshut downable, and so are we. So, no need to tremble, no need to fear. In the name of Jesus, amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts, your minds faithful in Christ unto life everlasting. Amen. We speak together the words of the Apostles' Creed, confessing our faith in our God. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As you know, at this point in the service, we normally have opportunity to return to the Lord of our gifts and our tithes and our offerings, those which we freely give from his bounty for his work in his world, whether through the mail or online or by drop-off at the church office. Opportunity to give still abounds. Let us pray. O oh Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to worship and praise you, the only true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And in these peculiar times, we thank you for the miracle of technology 
through which you provide many of us the opportunity to be gathered together in your name online. Establish our hearts firmly in your word that we may trust all that you promise and obey all that you command, lest we become behind in any blessing you desire to give us. Move us daily to sincere repentance, and when we come confessing our many transgressions, enable us to trust your great mercy. Give us faith to lay our burdens of sin beneath the cross of Christ, knowing that he has surely purchased our salvation with his own blood. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Keep our faith from failing in times of trouble, Teach us to look to you as our helper, in times of sorrow as our comforter, in times of weakness as our strength, in times of peril as our protector, in times of need as the giver of all that we need to support this body and life. Thank you for all the blessings you so bountifully bestow. May we serve you with the best of our gifts and abilities. Sanctify us and make us ready to do every good work. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give your comfort, we pray, to Amy and family upon the death of her grandmother, and continue your comfort within the Page family. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And thank you, Lord, for an 87th birthday for Katie. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In their time of need, give exactly what you know they need to Larry and Debbie, to Ron and Jean, to Jim, to Greg, to Sandy, and we ask your traveling mercies for Clea and Robert. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. According to your good and gracious will and timing, Once again, gather the members of this congregation for in-person worship and the public hearing of your word. Through the precious gospel of salvation that is shared by all, increase the bond of brotherly love among us. Remind us to pray for one another and make us willing to share one another's burdens. Preserve us from being so so heavily frightened with the happenings of this life that we fail to give adequate time and attention to your word. Help us grow to full Christian maturity through the spiritual food which you so graciously set before us. Watch over us as the apple of your eye and preserve for us the freedoms that we enjoy in this favored land. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Together we pray as our Lord Jesus has taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. With open hands and hearts and ears, we now receive the benediction of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.
left for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy rib inside which flow be of sin the double cure. Cleanse me from its guilt and power. Not the lady.